Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or if indeed you're new, welcome. Please like and subscribe and today's video I decided I wanted to just do a chatty one after doing the mental health tag. If you haven't seen that already I will leave it on the screen here for you. I decided that I would talk a bit more about having an anxiety disorder. So if I look away it's because I've got some notes and stuff written down here as I find that's the easiest way to do things. So anxiety. Basically everybody gets anxious and sorry you're going to hear traffic because the window's open. My glasses are steamed up so I might just take these off. Basically anxiety, everybody gets anxious. Um, it's a reaction to could be anything, it could be social situations, it could be that you're just a stressy type person, it could be social anxiety so you don't like big groups or crowded places, it could be to do with travelling, health, there's all different types out there. For me, I would say my anxiety is based around probably more to do with if I get any kind of illness. Now, before you all start going hypochondriac, no, that's not what I mean. It's not health anxiety that I suffer with, or I would be constantly just staying hidden in my room. But when I do sometimes get overwhelmed with feeling unwell, it kicks off anxiety within my body and it goes into that fight or flight panic mode. Now, as I have said before in previous videos and I have also said on my blog, which is scottishcosmetics.blogspot.com, I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, which is different to just normal anxiety. And I've got some notes here that I was also given by my doctor so that there are certain people out there that are ignorant and will go, Joey, it's just anxiety you've got. It's not an anxiety disorder. What makes you so different to everyone else that suffers with anxiety? This is why I wanted to do this video for those certain majority of ignorant people out there. So some of the things it says regarding an anxiety disorder that I was given by the doctor. Basically, the, the three terms it says what is an anxiety disorder? Why is it different from normal anxiety? The three points that it highlights is it's more severe, it lasts longer, and it interferes with the person's working life and relationships. Now, I, from personal experience, can tell you that it did affect everything I did from work, from day to day life, I first got it so between about 2003 probably up to about 2006 it took over until I had CBT therapy which I'll go into either later on or in another video and the floxetine which is a mild form of Prozac which I take these things and good friends and family and just getting used to it keep saying and, 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 has helped me. But the difference between it being an anxiety disorder and being just a little bit anxious is that it will always be with me. I'm always going to suffer with it. As the doctor says, I'm not just going to wake up one day and be like, God, I don't have anxiety anymore. I might not have anxiety today. I might not have it for the next few months. I might not have it for the next year. But it will always be there. So that is the difference between just being a little bit anxious now and again and having an anxiety disorder. The other things it says here is that many people with an anxiety disorder do not realise that there are treatments that can help. And as it says here, one in ten adults have an anxiety disorder, but a lot of them will not seek professional help. The reason a lot of people don't want to seek professional help is one, because they don't want to admit to it and deal with it and two it's the stigma of others around you that are going to say you look fine get a grip get over it that is not helping anyone 
Now, the guidelines, the NICE, it's called N-I-C-E, which is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Their guidelines for anxiety state the following key points of an anxiety disorder are common, chronic, the cause of considerable distress and disability. Now, when it says disability and distress, for me, I went out with my dad one day, it was when I signed off from work, and I went down to the pier, which is down, I say, Nile of Sky, and it, sometimes in the busy period of summer, dad will just go down and sit in his car, and he likes to people watch, and he was like, come on, come and get some fresh air, and I thought, right, okay, I can do this. I thought, I'll get out of the car, I know my dad's there, I'll walk down and into the pier and get some fresh air, and I don't know how to explain it to anybody, because... Unless you have experienced it yourself, you're not going to understand it. I got out of that car and the terror, that's the only word to explain it, the terror took over my body. I don't know why. And I physically could not make my body move to walk down that pier. And it was the most dehabilitating, if that's the right word, feeling. And I just was so terrified. So that to me was disability and distress. For whatever reason was going on in my mind, my body, it was like, you're not going for this walk. This is not happening for you. The other points that's got here is that it's often unrecognised and untreated, which is why if you are seriously affected by any kind of symptoms that aren't to you just a normal day of being stressed or anxious or depressed, please go and seek help. Don't let it carry on because it'll make your life miserable and people are there to help you. Don't feel ashamed to ask for the help. The other thing that's got here are, are costly to both the individual and society if left untreated. Treatable through a range of effective interventions. I would say probably what they mean by that is that you can obviously see your doctor, you can go to discussion groups, you could be referred for CBT therapy, you could just go to a therapist, you could try alternative methods. I don't mean legal eternal methods, I mean like meditation, all these other things. But if it's left untreated, as I say, the only person that's going to suffer, well not all necessarily the only person that's going to suffer because your friends and family, if you've got kids, a partner, they're going to suffer too because it's not just you that's going through it, it's them too. Um, not permanent individuals do get better and remain better. Improved when people are involved in making decisions about their own treatment and recovery and it's aided by access to information including support groups. So I suppose in a way you're going to say, you've just said it, is, it lost, lasts long and then the next, this next point in this leaflet that the doctor gave me, it says own treatment and recovery but what it means is that you find ways of coping and dealing with it better as we all do like someone obviously I can't speak for I don't want to say I know what it's like to have bipolar or something because I don't I've never had that but it's like saying to someone that's got bipolar oh well you're fine no they're not they clearly are not fine we all have different levels of different things so we all need to bear that in mind when we judge other people Excuse me. Now, again, anxiety comes in all different ranges and forms. So, as it says, there's a little paragraph here, I don't want to read it too much, but it says people can experience anxiety in a general way when they feel worried about many different things for no obvious reason. This is known as generalised anxiety and can be very unpleasant. Sometimes people are dismissed as just worriers when in fact they have a real mental health problem that can be helped with right treatment. So again, as I was saying, we all do get anxious. But for some people, it is really extreme. For me, for the past year or so, it's not been extreme. But for a good couple of years, it took over every single stage of my life 
for nearly every day of a good couple of years. That's not to say that because I'm coping the now, that it'll stay that way. It's good if it does. But some people fall back. I might stay on an even kill. Who knows? So, what other things have we got here? Panic attacks. Now, when it comes to panic attacks, I... Not sure if I've actually had one now. You're probably all going to go, Julie. Surely you would know. But most people, when they associate with panic attacks, you see the person and they're getting the, the bag and they're blowing into it for breath. They can't breathe. Oh my god, and they're hyperventilating. No one else tells you that it's not just that. Like a, a person having a panic attack, you can have loads of different symptoms. You can have increased heart rate, which is obviously a big one of those. Now, when I had anxiety, my heart was beating like there was no tomorrow. I felt like everybody around me could hear my heart beating, but obviously they couldn't. Sweating. The sweats that I get are unbelievable. Now, one, I'm only 33. Before you all see it, I do suffer with sweats. One, I think, is to do with the medication that I do take for anxiety because that is one of the side effects. And two, my mum and two of her sisters all went through the menopause in their mid to late 30s. So there is a chance that I could as well. But also, when I get hot, it makes me anxious. Not all the time, because I've learned to deal with that and be like, oh, you're just warm, don't panic about it. So that's another symptom you can get when you have a panic attack. It's not just a case of get me a bag, I need to breathe into it. So trembling and shaking is another one. You know, you can get trembly or shaky and like, you know, it's the fight or flight responses taken off again. Chest pains and discomfort. Another one is you could feel sick or have a sore stomach. You know, there's loads of them. Feeling dizzy, uh, you could even feel hot or cold, numbness, tingling, pins and needles, um, unsteady, feeling faint, headaches. So for me, when it came, comes to a panic attack, the symptoms I get are really tight head up here, roasting. I get chest pains, I get the over beating heart rate. I get the hot and the cold chills. I haven't had the, I can't breathe. So if someone says to you, you're having, they're having a panic, panic attack and you're thinking to yourself, but you're not needing a bag and gasping for breath. That's not always the case of the symptoms of a panic attack. What else? So the other things that I was wanting to show you is obviously I was referred for CBT therapy which is cognitive behavioural therapy. Now this is one of the worksheets that I was given and it looks like this and it's called Noticing and Changing Extreme and Unhelpful Thinking by Dr Chris Williams and it's a five areas approach helping you to help yourself. And you can go onto our website called www.livinglifetothefull.com. I'll put that in the description bar. <clears throat> and basically, the CBT therapy lady would go through some of these with me at my sessions. And sometimes she would send me home with this so that I could go through it myself. And like, I'm, this is just to give people a bit of information if you want it. And obviously in the first section it's got like the introduction and it's broken down into points and then it's got here unhelpful thinking style typical thoughts and then tick if you have noticed this thinking style recently even if only sometimes and then you work your way through them so it's got like when we feel unwell we often start to notice anxious fears which make us feel tense and stressed Unhappy negative thoughts which make us feel low and sad. Frustrated angry thoughts at ourselves, our situation and sometimes other people such as our friends and relatives. We may have all sorts of unhelpful thoughts about how we feel, our current situation and our future outlook. 
In this workbook, we do will learn how to notice patterns of extreme unhelpful thinking that worsen how you feel. Change extreme and unhelpful thinking, experiment and test out your thinking, and come up with more balanced and helpful thoughts. Tackle difficulties such as what to do if thoughts go round and round in your head. So it's little things like that. And at the time when you're suffering with anxiety, you're just like, oh my God, I don't, you don't even want to do this. But trust me, take the time, if you can get onto that website and have a look, or you know you get transferred to CBT therapy, do do the worksheets because they do help. And then there's loads of different things. You know, you get key points at the end, you get examples of charts and all the all these different things. So these are just the example of one of the workbooks. Another thing I was given was this, excuse me, which is called Unhelpful Thinking Styles and it's broken down to categories. And what we have here is all or nothing thinking and it's sometimes called black and white thinking. If I'm not perfect, I have failed. Either I do it right or not at all. So we all do that. It's got overgeneralising. Seeing a pattern based upon a single event or being overtly, overtly broad in the conclusion we draw. So overgeneralising. Everything is always rubbish or nothing good ever happens. So it's negative, negative thoughts as you're overgeneralising. And then you've got mental filter, which is only paying attention to certain types of evidence, noticing our failures but not seeing our successes. So like, I am always hard on myself. I see all the negatives. I could write you a list of all negatives about me. Ask me to write a list of positive things about me and it's really difficult. So it's stuff like that. Like I can tell you, oh yeah, I feel this, this, this and that today. And I might have succeeded at one thing. So it's getting yourself to think in a more positive way. It's re CBT therapy is basically retraining your brain, which is hard. Especially after you've gotten out of that baby into toddler stage. You're pretty much, it's hard to change your thought processes. So this is what a lot of CBT therapy is about. Another one we've got is disqualifying the positive and it shows a little bin there and it says discounting the good things that have happened or that you have done for some reason or another that doesn't count another one which we all do is jumping to conclusions which is this little box down here and it says there are two key types of jumping to conclusions mind reading imagining we know what others are thinking and fortune telling, predicting the future. Now we all do this, we can all sit there panicking and going, oh my god, like even when I'm filming this video, I could be thinking to myself, people must watch this and think she's terrible, she's rubbish at this, why is she even doing YouTube? One, she hasn't got a clue how to edit, two, she's got no makeup on and she's ugly in that, in her state, eh, why should we subscribe to her channel and all these sorts of things? But what I have to retrain myself to do is, why shouldn't I make a YouTube channel? Why shouldn't I sit here with just my phone and, so what, I don't know how to edit. So what, I don't have a big fancy camera and I don't have a MacBook or an iPad or whatever else. I don't have millions of thousands of subscribers. And some people might not like my video. Not everyone's going to. Do they need to watch it? No, they don't. Sometimes you just got to put into perspective and sometimes it's easier said than done. Even take this week for example, I mean, I know it's because it's getting to that time of the month that I am feeling down on myself. I know I look ugly sitting here right now without my makeup on. I know that makeup makes me look better, but sometimes when I put makeup on I feel like I look like a, a drag queen because I've got too much on. We're all going to pick apart ourselves. I never big myself up. I don't think I'm amazing at YouTube. I was discussing earlier with my work colleague and he was joking and saying, and even my boyfriend was joking and saying, oh, you know, when you're a big star, remember us. And I'm like, I'm never going to be a big star. That's not why I'm doing this. If something positive comes from this, whether it's opportunities or work or 
anything like that like some youtubers do get that's fantastic i like doing this because i love watching youtube the videos that i film are videos that i like to watch so it gave me inspiration to do it and at the end of the day I do think I'm funny and I can be humorous. I would like to think that I'm interesting enough that people will stick around and watch it. And as I say, there's loads of people out there on YouTube, so if you don't like it, don't watch it. So basically, when it comes to CBT therapy, it's about training the mind and the thought process to not be panicking and negative and that the things you're thinking and feeling are not always necessarily the case. So you don't need to be panicking or worrying about them. Retraining is basically the key and the aim of CBT therapy. Well, this video is already 20 minutes long, so I think I should stop there. But I basically feel inspired to come on and do this after doing my mental health tag. And as I say, I will leave the links to that video. If you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up like hit the subscribe button because that really helps to support my channel and it's great to help each other out leave any comments below please don't be negative if you've got negative or stigma type things to say about mental health or why i've done this then please just don't bother because nobody needs that let's just spread the love here and i hope you have a fantastic day and i will see you again soon Bye.